So we'll continue here talking about uh, MR scan of the, uh, of the shoulder, and we're in the area of the rotator cuff. So uh, Pablo, what do you think about this case? Okay, uh, so we have an axial view, T2, a coronal PD pet Oh, it's a sagittal and a coronal. Sorry, sagittal. Oblique sagittal and coronal. Sagittal and coronal, yeah. Um, so I see uh, some hyperintensity, more so in the PD fat set of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, also, there's a little bit of hyperintensity. Oh, okay, so there's some more anteriorly in the anterior aspect of the supraspinatus tendon. Looks like uh, there's a, a polyatir. tear. Uh, I'm not sure if it's you, you think You think it's a, yeah. well, I think it's tear now. It's not it's very, very bright. Thin. It's not fluid signal. No, it's not fluid signal. Yeah, I just saw it thinner, so I thought maybe it's part yeah. of this is absence. So, so I think absence. this was tendinosis, tendinosis at this time. Okay. The patient had no symptoms. Okay. <clears throat> the patient happened to be me. Uh, okay. Keep going. Okay, so this is on 6-25-1998. Okay, uh, now this is nine years later. Now, okay. and as John was referring to the image quality change, this is actually, John, the same scanner as before. It's just with the more advanced software. Okay, so uh, here, uh, this is 2007, and uh, we have two coronal views, of T2 and PD fat set, intermittent pain for four years after body surfing injury, severe pain for five months. And uh, I see, it looks like um, uh, complete tear, uh, full thickness tear, with the fluid uh, signal intensity. I think there's, there's a linear hypointensity high, high on the T2, I, I would think that's scar. Yeah, and there's so, a retraction. Right. Of and the, there's a little retraction. retraction. So I think it's about a centimeter tear with some scar in sight to it. It's a chronic right. tear at the typical location, which is the anterior insertional uh, component right here. This is the same area where we saw the tendinosis mm. uh, sure. nine years earlier. Uh, but uh, this, this patient has had pain for four years uh, at this particular time. So what would you recommend? Uh, in terms of uh, treatment, yeah, uh, to consultation with orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. But, so, um, so I talked. I, with, I, I talked with an orthopedic surgeon. We decided on surgery. Uh, it was supposed oh. to be on a Monday. The Sunday night, I was feeling a little bit better because they had started me on physical therapy. So I called him, and we decided to uh, postpone the surgery mm. and do more physical therapy. So this was a full thickness tear. Now, by physical therapy, I just had a meeting with a physical therapist. We went through some exercises for the rotator cuff, and then I actually did the exercises at home rather mm -hmm. than going into the offices. So on 6-21-07, then I started uh, physical therapy. And remember, I'd been symptomatic for four years. And uh, this is what was, it looked like two months later. So what do you think here two months later? So uh, there's still a gap with the fluid, but uh, the edges of the... Uh, are more well defined of the of the tear, uh, so uh, but they're still we, we don't really see the scar in situ quite as well. Okay, so this was okay. Oh, I see. Now, uh, for, so this was two months after I started doing exercising, and then now this is uh, six months after I started mm -hmm. doing exercising. So what do you think now? And and so, by this time I was actually asymptomatic. So uh, still uh, similar fluid fill gap. Uh, maybe there's a line, I'm, I'm not sure, in the T2 inferiorly close to the bone there. Uh, I, I, that could be a scar. Yeah. Uh, so, very yeah. small amount. So, this is 12 20, now, oh, seven. now, the interesting thing about this, the tear is still there, but at this point, there was no pain for the first time in like four years. Uh, so, this is 12 20, oh, 07. Okay, then uh, uh, 10 months later, this is what it looked like. Uh, so here we see a uh, linear hypointensity. I think that's it's very thin, so it's probably a small scar there. Uh, yeah, so probably scar in situ here, so it's probably blurry. scarring in. And then uh, uh, this is what the sagittal look like. You don't see quite the same area of, of fluid collection. And then, uh, and then now again, about two years after that, this is what it looked like. So it looked pretty stable after that, but at this time, there was no symptoms uh, doing full uh, athletic activity. And the interesting thing about this is it really kind of shows that tears can stabilize. Mm. And then the same thing happened on the other side a couple of months ago. I uh, went in and was going to have uh, 
surgery on the other side, and then I decided to go in and start doing a lot of exercising. And again, the, the symptoms went away when I started exercising. And why the symptoms go away when I exercise the muscle and the tendon that's torn, uh, I really don't understand that. John, do you have any idea why that's the case? But now that I'm back exercising, uh, the, uh, the pain is gone. Uh, I think if you, like uh, when you exercise, the uh, pectoralis major and um, latissimus dorsi, and, and you work on the infraspinatus uh, muscle, uh, teres minor, that pull, pulls the shoulder down and away from the from the um, acromion, and 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 I think by remo removing the head pressure on the acromion, um, uh, uh, you, you relieve the symptoms. Now, wh why uh, uh, and how long it takes? Um, I have no clue. But the thing about the shoulder, pain will come and go once you have a tear. Um, it, it will come suddenly without any apparent re reason, but most of the time uh, some type of movement that uh, you're not used to produces it. And then, then it takes time uh, to get rid of the pain. It's um, mostly a tincture of time and, and um, um, proper care of the shoulder after you tear the cuff, um, um, but not the same kind of activity as you were doing before to cause it. So you have to avoid um, contact between the head uh, and, and, and um, the chromium. Okay. Yeah, well, I, what I find is that if I don't do exercise, uh, exercise the rotator cuff muscles directly, it starts hurting. If I continue to exercise every week, I, I, I stay asymptomatic, mm -hmm. so it's just kind of interesting. It's just the opposite of what I would expect of something that's torn. Mm -hmm. You'd think to leave it alone and not strain it would be better. Anyway, so uh, well, here. I have a torn cuff, too, and, and I've had it for probably 20 plus years. Um, even when I, uh, I even play golf, but uh, what I do is I, I mainly work on latissimus dorsi, and um, that takes a, I, I, if you hold it for five seconds or so, that takes away the pain. Um, I, I think it's the contact between the head and, and, and the chromium that produces it, and if you take the pressure off, uh, you relieve the pain. Anyway, that's just my my idea on it. Okay. All right. So coronal and sagittal images of the shoulder, and it looks like there's a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus anteriorly. Yeah. And again, there's a typical location, the anterior insertional tear. So this is a six-year-old other radiologist. He also refused surgery and started physical therapy. And this is, uh, uh, and then here he is uh, a few years later and uh, continues to exercise. You can actually see there's an in increase in the bulk of his muscles in between these two. And he also is asymptomatic at this particular time. And we can see there's scarring in the area where we had the tear again. Uh, not too dissimilar from my own. Yeah. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, tears of, uh, of the uh, rotator cuff or really any tendons, uh, the good evidence now suggests that it typically starts with degenerative changes that we talked about in the last lecture. And then uh, you can go on to partial tears uh, and then go on to complete tears. But, uh, John? May I interrupt you for a moment? Yes. If you notice uh, on both those MRI viewers and other radiologists, um, you're, the, the head of the humerus is not riding high, or at least I don't think it's riding high. Maybe your idea is different. Um, if it was riding high, uh, you would not getting, uh, get the 
benefit from exercise that you um, do uh, at, at this point in time. That's that's uh, that's probably a good point. Thanks, John. You bet. Okay, so 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 we start with kind of a tendinosis, which is kind of a form of kind of diffuse partial tearing, really, of the of the uh, fibers of the uh, of, of the tendon with some attempt of the body to repair it, and then we get the signal changes that we talked about last time. Uh, but also you can have occasionally an acute tear, not secondary to degenerative disease. These are typically more muscle strains, especially in younger patients, and they can be within the muscle or at the musculotendinous junction. Uh, but most, most partial tears that we see are typically in older individuals and they're more chronic. And they can be tears in the tendon proper, which can either be transverse or longitudinal, or they can be tears at the end plate insertion. And for many years, it was believed that most of these occurred in the critical zone of the supraspinatus tendon, which is about a centimeter to two centimeters proximal to its insertion. And it was thought to be due to primarily to, to impingement that we talked about in the impingement section. Uh, now we know that the vast majority of these start actually at the uh, tendon insertion, and the vast majority are at the insertion, the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon on the greater tuberosity, and all of you have been reading MR scans, have seen that over and over again uh, just in the few months that we've been reading here in the fellowship program. So we now know that most of these actually start at the bone tendon insertion, which is the weak link in older individuals. And younger people, really young people, it's typically the bone that's the weak link, as you know, um, and the teenage, it's typically the muscles. So you can evaluating partial tears uh, there are several different grading systems. Uh, Harvey Elbman had a grading system, uh, which is primarily for open surgery. Uh, grade one was less than a three millimeter in uh, size tear. Grade two is between three and six, and a grade six, uh, grade three was greater than six millimeters. Uh, in the area of arthroscopy, I don't know any arthroscopists who are using this system anymore. Typically, uh, what people use now is low grade versus high grade where low grade means that the, the thickness of the tear is less than 50% of the thickness of the tendon, and a high grade is greater than 50% of the thickness. And there are a couple of papers to suggest if you have a high grade tear, greater than 50% of the thickness, strain on that tendon may cause symptoms, and some people will repair those if they're symptomatic enough, whereas low grade tears less than 50%, most people believe to, are not symptomatic tears. Other forms of tears that people talk about, one is the pasta partial articular surface tendon avulsions. Uh, and this is where the inferior insertion of the tendon on the greater tuberosity tears and retracts, whereas the superior portion of the tendon stays in, intact. And so it's called a pasta tear, and I'll show some examples. Another one that people talk about is a paint tear, partial thickness articular surface intratendinous tears, uh, typically seen in overhead Foot, uh, contact uh, athletes and the foot plate still intact. And this is a tear of the uh, intrasubstance tear uh, due to uh, failure of the, the internal tendon from st or repetitive strain injury. But it's, it's articular surface, that one. The, the pasta is articular surface. The, the, uh, the paint is an intraarticular tear. Oh, intrasubstance, I think. Intra yeah. So, uh, Let's see here. So, uh, Sahar, what do you think of this case? Okay, 23-year-old baseball pitcher, weakness for four months, no trauma except for baseball. Um, there is increasing in, in the supraspinatus fibers. I see see this little attachment actually well so i'm wondering if there was like partial tearing with a scarring this study for the sagittal images yeah there's atrophy of the muscle on the sagittal yeah so notice how big all the other muscles are and there's isolated severe fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus here so uh uh this this most of the time when i've seen this in baseball players it's the infraspinatus that's involved, and I showed you an example of that of a Major League Baseball pitcher who had a posterior labral tear. 
Uh, rarely it can be the supraspinatus. And a lot of these players can be relatively high level players if they have a single muscle that atrophic like this. Uh, my guess is these come from some sort of traumatic injury to the nerve supply, and it's a chronic denervation injury. Uh, because if you go back here, you can see that the tendon is perfectly intact. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty rare, uh, but it's something to recognize. This was also in a baseball player. Okay, Thomas, what do you think of this case? A uh, 31-year-old male with pain after a weightlifting injury. Uh, there was some signal within the supraspinatus tendon uh, consistent with tendinosis, some AC joint, and severe um, labrum intact. Yeah, the, this degree of signal within the tendon, it could be a little bit of tendinosis. It's pretty black on the T2 sequence. So uh, I think that could be mild tendinosis. Uh, see anything else here? Uh, yeah, there's edema within the supraspinatus muscle. Right. So we have edema up here in the supraspinatus. And remember, yeah. uh, when, in young people, you can get muscle strains. And uh, this is a supraspinatus muscle strain, an acute injury to the muscle itself. Okay. Um, 16-year-old male pitcher, pain throwing for two weeks, low label tear, uh, two coronal views. Um, it's like, uh, was it T1 or PD fat set and, uh, and T2? That's a T1 and a T2. T1 and T2. And... Um, so uh, there is a linear hyperintensity that I see in both T1 and T2, kind of closer to the uh, bursal side. It's uh, longitudinal. Oh, and there's another. No, I was talking about in the foot yeah. plate, and just below yeah, the yeah. right there. Yeah. Okay. And but now that you pointed out an area of the muscle tendinous junction, there's hyperintensity on T2 and also PD fat side. Looks like a, a strain injury there. Yeah, Maybe so, a tear or partial tear. So, so this is another muscle, uh, a supraspinatus muscle strain. This is running the muscle. This is closer to the musculotendinous junction than the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, but remember, you can get partial tears of the muscle in the area around the rotator cuff, and that can be very symptomatic in athletes. What What's interesting, John, um, that we haven't talked about is if you look at this patient, this 16-year-old, uh, the musculotendinous junction uh, is uh, distal to the uh, acromial. Right. Uh, uh, and the other one was uh, way proximal to the acromion. And here's the musculotendinous uh, junction here. Right here would be the uh, I think that, that, that's tendon, isn't it? Uh, right in here. Here's the oh. musculotendinous junction. Here's muscle coming down here. Yeah, yeah, but th this is this is more normal, and I agree with you, John. This one is not normal. This has a distal muscular tendinous junction, like we talked about in previous lecture. I think, I think that's congenital and I agree um, abnormality. Yep, I think so. That they may predispose to having the muscle tear in this area uh, due to this limited space here. It could be par partially contusion. <clears throat> okay. okay. Okay, so we have two coronal images of the shoulder, and I believe we're posterior here. Um, so it looks like there's high signal in probably the teres minor. The teres minor would be down, down there. Okay, so it's going to be higher up, so infra. Okay, infraspinatus. And there it is back there. Yeah. So what is this? So um, I'd be worried about a low-grade strain in this case. So it's a, it's a partial tear of the infraspinatus muscle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Okay, so we can get partial tears of the muscle, as we talked about. Uh, here's a... A uh, bigger example of a muscle tear of the infraspinatus back here where there's actually some retraction. 
uh, and extensive edema within the infra spinous. And there's also some strain of the subscap in this particular injury. This was a higher higher level injury than the, than the previous one. Sahar, what do you think of this one? The 38-year-old male with shoulder pain and limitation of motion after lifting injury. And the tear is minor, it's very small, a sense that there's like isolated atrophy of the tear is minor. Um, I don't really see anything in the quadrilateral space. Okay. So it's good to look in the quadrilateral space here. It looks like the vessels have normal flow. We don't want to see a mass. Mm -hmm. Here we can see the rest of the muscles are extremely well developed. So this is a big weight lifter. Uh, but again, we can see abnormality back here in the teres minor. And uh, here we can see that, and we didn't see really any edema. Uh, this is isolated teres minor atrophy, uh, which uh, isn't rare, but we don't see it all the time. Uh, but again, this is a weightlifter, probably due to either an injury to the to the uh, nerve that goes to it, or an, or an old tear of the muscle that just didn't heal properly. Okay, Thomas, what do you think of this one? Uh, so there's some fatty atrophy of uh, teres minor, seen both on the sagittal and coronal planes. Yeah, and now, then on the X. Now th th these are T2s. And then this is a PD fat set. So uh, I'm not sure oh, okay. if the here or not here. If it were a T1, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, it would just uh, be edema within the teres minor yeah. muscle. You can see, I think there's a tear here, the tendon, with some uh, edema extending back into the muscle itself. So this is a teres minor uh, tear. And this is a more severe example of a tear of the teres minor. You can see that kind of feather appearance of the, of the muscle. If that's all you see in the muscles, otherwise normal morphology, people call it a grade one tear. If you have a hematoma in it, it's a grade two. Grade three is where you have a complete rupture and retraction. Here we can see extensive abnormal signal intensity and probably some edema here in, in the more proximal part of the, of the teres minor. This was... Uh, a, Probably a very high grade, grade one, mm -hmm. uh, really a uh, uh, pretty high grade tear. Okay. Um, 17 year old female with pain after a fall. So the uh, sagittal T2 and the coronal P fat set. Uh, so it uh, looks like that's, uh, uh, I think that's posterior, so, or is that uh, anterior? That's no, the, this is anterior here, posterior, posterior back posterior. here. Posterior, so that would be uh, the, um, a teres minor uh, edema with uh, looks like maybe a hematoma, probably rub, uh, tear there. Uh, looks like um, maybe a grade three because there's some retraction and I see fluid okay. there. So. Can, what's this? This is actually bone retracted. So this oh, is so an avulsion an fracture. So this is actually a surgical lesion. So whenever you see these, you've got to look to see if you think that the, uh, the tendon is torn off the bone, mm -hmm. then it, it becomes uh, likely to be a surgical lesion. If you think the tear is really at the musculotendinous juncture within the muscle, it's usually treated conservatively. So seeing a little piece of bone pulled off here is a significant finding. Mm -hmm. And you can, if you have plain film, check on the plain film. If there's a major concern, typically it's not, MR is usually pretty good. You can usually see the, the origin of it off the bone as well, but you could get a CT confirm it. And here's just a tear of the musculotendinous junction, which is a, par, uh, a partial tear of the musculotendinous junction in this patient. Okay. All right. Coronal image of the shoulder, and it looks like there is a uh, Bursal surface fraying or low grade partial tearing of the supraspinatus. Up here? Excuse me, uh, articular surface fraying. So in here. Yep. Okay. And similarly, it looks like there's articular surface fraying and maybe a low grade partial tear. Yeah, a little partial tear at the musculotendinous junction there as well. Right. So, so that's partial tear. What grade would you give this? Uh, low grade. 
Yeah, it's less than 50% of the thickness, so it would be considered low grade. Okay. Uh, Sahar, what do you think of this? Okay, I'll wait for tear. So there is a moderate grade artificial surface tear of the super spinatus. And there is. Yeah. Okay. I think it's about like 50%. What do you think caused that? I'm sorry. What do you think? Well, there it is, right there, right? So, so what do you think caused that? Here's some more images. Okay. Is the vision full stop? Yeah. Yes. That's, gonna be, that's actually the track of an arthroscope, a posterior portal. And this is this was all due to the arth arthroscopy portal. Okay. After surgery. And here's a patient, an older study where we can see a muscular tendon as partial tear of the supraspinatus right at the junction. Okay. Okay, Thomas, this was a 14 year old who had acute pain. Uh, so on a T1, PDF, PDFS, coronal, uh, C. I guess uh, severe tendinosis of the supraspinatus uh, without tear. Now, he really had an acute injury in this case. So, uh, and then here's, here's the T2. It shows that it's not very broad on the T2. And here we can see a sagittal image. Uh, so we felt, but due to the history and the fact that it was a young 14-year-old, instead of calling it tendinosis, we really thought that this was a strain of the mm. supraspinatus tendon. And uh, that patient did well just with conservative treatment. Okay. Uh, okay. Pablo? We have a coronal uh, PD fat set uh, in the supraspinatus tendon, and there's uh, increased hyperintensity, hopefully. In the, uh, looks like. Um, this could be a tear. I mean, I would like to see a T2, see if there's any. It looks like it's intrasubstance. I mean, I see con there's fibers on the first on the articular side. So okay. maybe it's, uh, even though it's pretty extensive in terms of the thickness, looks like it's intrasubstance. Uh, okay. So it, it turns out that in all of the cases where we've been able to get arthroscopic correlation, which isn't that many. So you have to take a little bit with a grain of salt. But when you see this black line down here, that typically means arthroscopically this is going to look normal. And also we can see it up here. The reason I point this out is that uh, I've had a, a number of situations where orthopedic surgeons have called me to complain about radiologists who called a tear when a tear wasn't there. And they did arthroscopy and couldn't find anything and got very frustrated. Uh, and almost always when that's been the case, you've seen big signal like this within the tendon, but the surface still has this low signal intensity. So I recommend that when you see this, you describe that. And in your report, you say this is severe tendinosis within the tendon or partial tear. If it looks like it's fluid, uh, but that the uh, joint side and whatever the dorsal side surface looks like, in this case, both the joint side and, and, and dorsal side surfaces look intact. And then if they patient is symptomatic and they arthroscope them, then there's an ex explanation why they may not be able to see the lesion because the lesion is primarily within the tendon. So, all right. Okay, it's a T2 study with an arthrogram. Okay. Um, so it looks like there is a uh, Hyper intense focal signal within the mid substance and the articular surface of the supraspinatus tendon. Okay. And there it looks like uh, gadolinium is sort of uh, getting into the lesion from the articular surface. It looks like yeah. a high grade articular surface. Yeah. yeah, and it turned out this particular patient, even though it looks like on the T2 that there might be an intact surface here. It, this was a high-grade partial tear arthroscopically. 
So the PD fat set is is a more reliable technique for looking at at the surface integrity than just the T2 weighted images. Okay. Uh, Sahar, what do you think of this? When is when you're on a repeater and increasing posterior axillary pain after pitching? Roll up very smooth or let this miss here. So we see some sub uh, cystic changes in the humeral head at the attachment of the suprasmatus. I don't really see anything in the muscle itself. And then I'm not showing you the teres major or the latissimus dorsi here because they were normal. Okay, so this was on 42209, and we can see that this is probably a chronic traction injury, primarily involving the bone here. And uh, so there's a point I want to make here. So this is on 42209. Uh, so the, they looked at this. There wasn't any tears of the of the muscles. So he continued to play and came back with increasing symptoms a month later, and this is what his studies look like a month later. So is this arthrogram or just? I don't know whether it's arthrogram or not, probably. Okay, so there is like moderate grade articular surface tear of the supraspinatus. So, so, so look at the difference between the, the tendon surface here between these two. And I don't remember whether there's an arthrogram or not, but it was the same technique on both of them. Uh, so what do you think's happened here? Uh, so hmm. the articular surface is very irregular on the follow-up image. And there are like there's like progression of the traction injury in the humeral head. Yeah, so, so I, I think one of the causes that can pr pr produce exacerbating pain and can be related to actually tendon tears themselves is when you have an avulsion fracture of the bony attachment. Then the tendon becomes unstable. And when we talk po about postal lesions in a minute, uh, I think a lot of those, what happens is that the bone gives way on the articular side, the tendon kind of retracts, and in this particular case, the, 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 you, you have this high, monitor to high grade partial tear of the tendon. And, and notice the big difference in the tendon in just a month change, but you can also see that there is now an interruption of the, of the cortical bone where the mm -hmm. tendon attaches here, uh, where before we had a cyst, but we still had basically intact uh, attachment of the cortical bone. And this, uh, the, the bone probably fractured. We can see some edema within the bone here uh, due to continuing to, uh, to pitch, even, even with shoulder pain. Uh, so this is really progression of the, the traction injury. Okay. Uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? So the coronal view uh, looks like the supraspinatus is uh, some signal within the tendon, so maybe some tendinosis, and what about the bone? Uh, there's maybe some cystic change at the footprint. Yeah, there's some erosive or uh, cystic change. This is on a this is a T1 weighted image. Here we have a PD fat set and a T2 weighted image showing it in the same area. And again, we can see that there's this kind of avulsion injury of the joint side attachment of the tendon uh, to the bone in this location. And as you know, especially at the infraspinatus insertion, uh, these traction injuries to the bone are really common. In fact, in adults, it would be uncommon to see an MR scan without traction changes at the infraspinatus insertion. They're really very common. And the, the other thing to remember that we really haven't talked a lot about is that the infraspinatus tendon, its attachment is a very broad attachment, and it involves most of the supraspinatus insertion area also has a lot of infraspinatus fibers in it uh, that come across from the back. So this is an area, this is a little bit kind of the posterior part of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus where basically both muscle tendons are attaching to the bone. And it's very common to see traction injuries uh, in this location. 
All right. Uh, let's see. But that was also a tear, insertional tear, not only the attraction system. Right. Right. And a lot of those, I think the bone often gives way first and then the tendon gives way. Right. Go ahead. A 61 year old dance instructor with increasing shoulder pain one year after a fall. Uh, we have two axial views, uh, T1 and PD fats, and a lot of uh, traction cystic changes in the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. It's like the infraspinatus pain level. And, uh, okay, so this is 6 8 2014. So what would you call this? Uh, well, it looks like there's um, tendinosis mostly and the cystic changes. Okay, and then it's very sharply demarcated here. Maybe a little bit of bone edema around it. Oh, so okay. probably maybe a little, a little acute on top of chronic traction mm -hmm. injury to the bone. Okay, so that's 6 8 2014. Uh, the patient then came up back almost a year later with increasing symptoms, and this is what it looks like. So there's increased erosion and bone marrow edema. At this point, I'm concerned about a hill sacs injury. Yeah, there's no uh, anterior dis dislocation. No anterior dislocation, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, and there's uh, increasing intensity of the infraspinatus tendon. Looks like uh, uh, yeah. probably a so, so this, this is just a progressive injury progressive. from a predative traction. Uh, primarily because of in her dance routines, she used a lot of her arm movements, mm -hmm. and this and there was a, a retraction of the infraspinatus against the bone, and you can see a progressive bone injury from the repetitive traction. Okay, is there partial tearing too, or that fluid? That uh, or well, there probably is some partial tearing partial here, or severe mm -hmm. tendinosis. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Seventeen-year-old. Yeah. 17 year old man with new onset shoulder pain, rule out labral tear, or bicep subluxation. New onset. Okay. Uh, so it looks like there is. Um, I would give it uh, moderate tendinosis, moderate to severe tendinosis with low grade intersubstance tearing of the supraspinatus. Well, a couple things. Notice that you have a superior and an inferior component of the supraspinatus. Mm -hmm. The inferior component is torn and retracted. This should be attaching out here. Mm -hmm. And it's retracted by about a centimeter and a half. And you've got this plane of a tearing intersubstance between the superior and inferior components. On the PD fat set, this is, the, the whole thing is a little bit less obvious on the T2 weighted image because we don't have quite as good a contrast because of all the scarring that's occurred here. And this is what you call a posta lesion, or an inferior partial tear with, with retraction. And then with the symptomatic, they're basically treated uh, with a, uh, uh, a suture anchor repair. Okay. Okay, uh, Sahar, what do you think of this case? That's a T1. Okay. Um, T1. Um... I see some low, I see some fibers that are slightly like proximally retracted, and maybe some thickening of the tendons. Thickening of the, a lot of things, but the musculotendinous junction is right about in the right mm -hmm. position here. Here's the PD fat set. Okay, so on PD fat set, we have um, moderate to high grade um, for, uh, articular surface tear of the supraspinatus. Yeah, so so I would I would just call it high grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Surgical literature, the low grade or high grade. There's no intermediate grade, and this is greater than fifty percent of the thickness, with just a little bit of superficial fibers involved, and probably a complete disruption of the inferior fibers. That's what it looks like on the T2 weighted image in this patient. So this would be a high grade partial tear. Thomas, what do you think of this case? Uh, so there's an interstitial tear of the supraspinatus uh, at the footprint. Well, here, here it is on the T2. Here's the PD fat sat with arthr arthrogram. And here, here really, we, we really need the T1, which I think I have here. But, but it looks like that inferior surface is not intact on this one. And there are the axial image showing us. Uh, <clears throat> 
And uh, this was a partial tear at a Major League Baseball pitcher. So here we have uh, two coronal images, one T2 and uh, T1 and T2. Um, so this atrophy of the deltoid muscle and the supraspinatus also looks like uh, with atrophy, I see thinning and um, probably partial tear or maybe probably a full thickness tear. I don't know if that's scar inside too. Okay, so, there so there's the certainly a lot of fluid, fluid uh, focal fluid pockets within the distal tendon here. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see the deep fibers. This, the bursal side fibers look like you know, it's, it may be attacked. Here's the sagittal oh. images. So so what would you call this? A partial tear, uh, high grade tear, uh, insertional okay. tear. So uh, this is plate. this is one that I got a call on where the orthopedic surgeon was very upset because at arthroscopy the shoulder looked mm. entirely normal. Mm. So, so, uh, uh, so again, well, when it's not clear that it actually goes through the joint side surface, I would just describe that in your report. Because uh, it turned out this patient probably was symptomatic from this because it's a near full thickness tear, but uh, it did not go through the joint side surface, so arthroscopically it couldn't be detected. And you just need to describe it in a way where the, where the surgeon understands that uh, when they get in surgery. Okay, uh, so here it looks like we have an intrasubstance tear of the... Sur sur surgeons make mistakes also. Oh, you you got to be kidding me, John. I didn't think that was the case. Well, I have to admit it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. At least you never did. The... Uh, not, not not often. <laughs> Never been sued. Good. Wow. So this looks like a, an intrasubstance tear of the supraspinatus with delaminating fluid back into the okay. muscle belly. Yeah. So it's a longitudinal intrasubstance tear. And most of these actually communicate in some location, but we can't always see the communication of them. And generally, when you give contrast, this, these will kind of fill sometimes in completely with contrast, but not always. Okay, uh, I don't remember this case. Sahar, what do you think of this one? Infrasinitis tendinosis bone in ray. I see increased intrasubstance signal in the distal fibers of the supraspinatus. Yeah, well, it's um, I would call it. Okay, so this is probably a, a previous study, the one that we're going to see in a minute. I'm sorry I don't remember this. Obviously, we've seen there's no bone injury. There is a tendinosis intrasubstance here. Uh, that's 531. Uh, this is now uh, the, the injury occurred on 1811, and now we have a study that's two months after the injury. So we see the old study, and now we see one right after the, a little bit after the injury. What do you think the difference is here? So on the second study, we have some characteristic change, uh, traction, acute traction injury in the humeral head, but I don't see that area of low signal in the tendon itself very well. All right, and then yeah. here's, a, here's another example. Here we can see more of the bone injury, maybe a little inner substance signal going into the infraspinatus. And then here's another cut. What do you think of this one? So, the, so the, this is that 317011, so the previous one we saw, and now here's another follow-up uh, four years later. Okay, now we have um, like a moderate-grade um, articular surface tear of the infraspinatus with traction cystic changes in the humeral head. And then here's uh, 311. 2011 and this is 8 2015 and we can see increasing interstitial tearing going into the infraspinatus tendon here and then just this just shows this is now 2016 and it shows how the bone 
injuries has maturated over time. We can see the different stages of the bone injury. And then here we can see the interstitial tear and the more chronic stage develop here. And the bone cyst. And the bone cyst, right. And this, this interstitial tears are typically due to shear injuries, and they're usually associated with one component of the tendon tearing off or a fracture of, the, of its bony attachment so that you get shear forces within the tendon. And that's what's thought to actually cause the development of the interstitial tears, these longitudinal interstitial tears. And by the time you see it, you may see the cyst or the interstitial tear, but the bone injury may have pretty much healed so that you don't recognize the bone injury, which caused the differential uh, strain within the tendon. And this tend to be longitudinal in shape? Yeah, well, when, the, when this happens, yeah, because the shearing forces within the tendon. Part of the tendon retracts, the other part doesn't, and it produces a shear injury within the tendon itself. Right. And then here we can see another longitudinal tear with fluid within the supraspinatus tendon. There's the tear really going to the surface. And on the, oops, a, no, this is a, a CT arthrogram where we can see the contrast extending into the longitudinal tear and where it, where it goes into the joint space up there. Again, this CT arthrogram showing that interstitial tear. And here's another interstitial tear. We can see the the bone injury, which is probably a component to the pathophysiology of these developing, and then the longitudinal fluid extending along the tendon back into the muscle here uh, <clears throat> with a large cyst within the supraspinatus muscle. Okay, let's see. Uh, who did the last one? Sorry. Okay, Thomas, what do you think of this one? Uh, so we have a coronal and a sagittal view, and there's increased signal within the supraspinatus in the region of the musculotendinous unit. Okay. Um, so this is on 4.14.03, then the patient came back with uh, symptoms four years later, and this is what it looked like four years later. Right, so now in the same area, there is uh, intramuscular cysts. Uh, Probably communicating with the uh, interstitial tear of the supraspinatus. Yeah, probably. Oh, yes, yeah, interstitial tear here, then probably something going back in this area as well. Nice uh, heart shape. Heart shape. Right? <laughs> yeah. so give this to your loved one on, <laughs> on Valentine's Day. It was done on Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Pablo, what do you think of this case? We have four images on the shoulder, uh, three coronals, and one sagittal. Um, see, so I see uh, in the sagittal there's some edema. Well, there's a high point tense area, uh, ovoid shaped, and there's uh, edema, uh, high point intensity throughout the muscle. I wonder if that's a uh, an old hematoma or an ossification. Well, why do you say old hematoma? Because of the high point intensity, or well, it could be, I guess, uh, subacute. Well, let's see. Why would an old hematoma be low in signal intensity? The hemosiderin. Yeah, but that, that would deposit into the tissues, right? Mm -hmm. This looks like it's uh, a, a big fluid, fluid yeah. collection. Uh, this is really an acute hematoma acute. because you, uh, uh, at this point, you, you really have uh, more, it's before you get deoxyhemoglobin, so it's before it actually gets bright in the T1-weighted images. Okay. So, and here we can see some abnormal sequentitsi here within the infraspinatus tendon, and, and here we can see a longitudinal tear within the infraspinatus tendon as well. Okay, so what do you think of this one? All right, 37-year-old male, with pain, rule out rotator cuff tear. So in this one, it looks like um, there's a partial thickness, low grade, uh, particular surface tear of the supraspinatus. Is this injury of the so super or the So question, which, which tendon is it in? So it's probably both of them. Okay, so let's just follow this. 
So, you know, this looks like the supraspinatus muscle here. And this is another one with a distal muscular tendinous junction, like mm -hmm. we've talked about. Uh, and then, so this must be the supraspinatus tendon. But then if we follow this tear back, go back there. If we go more posterior, it's there. If we go more posterior, it's there. And more posteriorly, mm -hmm. we're there. On the sagittal images, the actual uh, mm -hmm. uh, cyst is back here in the infraspinatus. So this just shows that the this is actually primarily the infraspinatus tendon at this mm -hmm. point. And again, it just shows that you get the overlap of the two tendons. And it turns out the infraspinatus tendon is a much larger tendon than the supraspinatus. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we call, not the, I'm not sure it makes a huge difference, but a lot of what we call supraspinatus is actually the infraspinatus tendon. It's a nice example of that. Okay. And the, the supraspinatus insertion is primarily anteriorly. Most of the mid and posterior insertion is really the infraspinatus, but they combine together. They have fibers of both there. That's really the overlap region there, which we, where we get a lot of tendinosis. Okay. Uh, Sahara, what do you think of this case? Okay. It's, um... There is some increased signal at the attachment of at the articular attachment of the supraspinatus. Maybe there's like a low grade articular surface tear. Okay, so this is an arthrogram. These are probably the PD fence ads. Mm -hmm. What the T2 looks like, which doesn't look real remarkable. So this is on 3-20-2007. So it looks like we have tendinosis, uh, the supraspinatus tendon, and uh, then the patient came back a year and a half later, and this is what they have. What do you think now? So I see like this is T1. I see like high area of like high signal and T1. Maybe there's some calcification there. This is T2 and this is a PD fat cell. Oh, this is T2. A little different technique. So you're right. We're seeing a little bit of increased signal intensity there. And uh, and this is really a partial tear at the insertional foot plate. Okay. All right. Uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? So, 27-year-old female with softball injury. Uh, it looks like there's tendinosis within the supraspinatus. There's extensive cystic change at the greater tuberosity, and uh, yeah, maybe some erosion at the foot, the footprint. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a little avulsion injury there at the foot plate. See a much larger uh, bone cystic change there, and there's the tendinosis within the tendon. That's right. So, uh, so this is really a, a partial tear at the, uh, really probably a partial avulsion of the uh, uh, tendon attachment there to the foot plate. Okay. Fifteen-year-old wrestler with uh, shoulder pain, um, coral and sagittal view. So, I'm sure this is an arthrogram or just a fluid in the joint. It's an arthrogram. Arthrogram. Um, so there's increasing intensity of the supraspinatus tendon, and also there's a high point intensity. I wonder if that's uh, part of the bone or an avulsion. Um, right, right in here? Right there, yeah, all the high point intensity there, but um, right there. there's edema. And there we can see right there. Yeah, and this is a really partial near. foot plate of bone avulsive oh. injury. And again, these you would like to, you, you want to protect these and let these heal. Uh, otherwise, they'll, they'll, it'll uh, avulse off, as you would expect. And we can see there's some bone edema here associated with it as well. Is the, the growth plate, that hyperintensity we see in the growth plate, would you consider that a saltaharis? No, no, I wouldn't. No, it's just a... yeah. Part of there's probably a little bit of chemical, yeah. No, oh. uh, no, never mind. I, no, this looks too normal, the growth plate. I, I wouldn't call that abnormal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, here here we can see a lot of increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon. Looks like uh, increased signal. This really looks like it's a, a tear with approximate retraction of the distal end of the tendon, approximate retraction of the muscular tendon this junction. So this really, uh, I, I feel quite comfortable. This is a supraspinatus tear with, with retraction. Uh, but what can happen with these, they can retract, and then you can get scarring here. And at surgery, this was considered normal in surgery. They, they weren't able to detect that. 
in retrospect, we went through this, and uh, they then did a, uh, they stuck the scope in the bursal side surface and saw the tear and did a repair. But going into the regular arthroscopy in the joint side surface, they really didn't detect this, this tear. But there is, you can see the retraction of the muscle tendinous Yeah, back here. Right back here. Yeah. And so it's a, so retracted about the same amount as the tear here with some mm -hmm. scar inside, too. And there's some fiber. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we stop here and we'll go into full thickness tears uh, and how to evaluate those starting tomorrow. Okay, any questions? Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you.